Welcome to the last section of notes for unit four. Um, today we're going to be talking about systems of nonlinear equations as well as some of the applications for quadratics. So as a warm-up, for each of our graphs below, let's talk about the number of real solutions by looking at the graph. Um, in fact, this is very similar to a question you would have seen on a recent quiz um, where you were asked to determine the number of solutions. Remember, number of solutions or real solutions are the number of x-intercepts. Remember, x-intercepts is another way of saying these solutions. So if a graph does not have any x-intercepts, then that tells you that there are zero real solutions for that equation. Whereas if it only has a single point where it crosses the x-axis, that means that it has one real solution. And finally, if there are two points where the, your function crosses the x-axis, that means that there are two real solutions to that function. So, remember that for a system of linear equations, we basically had three different scenarios that were possible. It was possible to have one solution if the two lines intersected with each other. It was also possible to have zero solutions or no solution if the lines did not cross and were parallel. And finally, it was possible to have an infinite number of solutions if the two lines were in fact the same line. So in a system of equations where one of them is now quadratic and the other is still linear, there's also gonna be three different types of solutions. One possibility is it's still possible to have no solution. So if you think about what that would look like, you'd have some form of a quadratic, and then you'd have a line which was not going to cross the quadratic at any of the points. It's also possible to have one solution. That would mean that the two different functions cross at a single point. So maybe this point right here. So they only cross at that single point. They're just kind of touching right at that one spot. The final possibility, which is different, is it's actually now possible to have two solutions, which would be that you had your quadratic, and then you had your line going through and crossing the quadratic at two separate points. So that would be another possibility would be two solutions. So notice the one that's different is when you have a quadratic and a linear function, there is no possibility for an infinite number of solutions because there's no way for the line to look exactly like the quadratic and be touching at all of those different points. So that is the one that is slightly different. Now, you can also have systems of equations where they're both quadratic. And if you think about what that would be, um, that would actually be more close to what we had for linear functions. So if they were both quadratic, you'd still have where there was no solutions, so they don't cross each other at all. You could still have one solution, which is where they would kind of just touch right at the vertex. You could also have two solutions where they're crossing each other kind of like this. And then you could actually get to an infinite number of solutions if you did have a graph where the two quadratics were in fact kind of the same right on top of each other. Now what we're going to focus more on is the systems like we've got in those boxes where you've got a quadratic and a linear function, but no, a lot of the same stuff still works if they're both quadratic. So let's talk about the different ways you can solve. Remember that there were three methods that we could use for solving a system of linear equations. We talked about graphing, elimination, and substitution. So we're going to actually look at all three of those for quadratic and linear systems as well. Let's start by graphing. In fact, we're going to do a couple of graphs by hand, in fact. So to graph these by hand on number one, if we were to graph y equals x squared plus one, we'll think about what that would be. Um, let's go ahead and just use an x, y, t chart to fill in those values um, from negative two up to positive two. So at negative two, negative two squared is four, and four plus one is five. For negative one, put that in for x in your first equation. That would be negative one squared, which is one, plus one is two. If we put in zero, zero squared is zero, plus one is one. And then the rest are actually going to be symmetrical since it's gonna be um, our vertex at zero comma one. So here is our graph for that function. I'm gonna zoom in just a little bit to make it a little bit easier to see that. Um, so we're gonna start at negative two comma five, negative one, two, 
0, 1, and then the same on the other side. So then our quadratic, if we draw in the rest of that, is going to look something kind of like this. So now we need to graph our other line. We need to graph our linear equation. So that's y equals x plus 1. So it looks like our y-intercept over on the right-hand side is going to be a positive 1, so right here. And then our slope tells us to go up 1 and over 1. So that would look something kind of like this if we continue to do that. And then we could draw our line through those points as best we can to figure out what our solutions are. In fact, there's two solutions. And you might have seen that you would have graphed two of these points right on top of one another. One of those is at 0, 1. The other is at 1, 2. So there are two solutions to this system of equations. OK, let's do the same thing with number 2. So we're going to graph our quadratic first. We've got our quadratic, which is y equals, in parentheses, x minus 2 squared plus 5. So notice that that is in vertex form. So we should be able to graph the vertex pretty easily. That's going to be at the point 2 comma 5. So let's go ahead and graph that point right here. That also means that that's where our axis of symmetry is. I'll go ahead and draw that in. And then we'll go ahead and use our y-intercept to find another point in order to graph. So for the y-intercept, remember that you're putting in 0 for x. So if you put 0 in for x in this first equation, 0 minus 2 is negative 2. Negative 2 squared is 4, and 4 plus 5 is 9. We'll then reflect that over our axis of symmetry, and then here is going to be the graph for our quadratic. All right, so now let's go ahead and graph our linear equation next. So negative 2x plus 9, so we've got 9 as our y-intercept, and then negative 2 over 1 for our slope. So we'll put a point at 0, 9. So it looks like we've already found one solution. And then we'll go down 2 into the right 1, down 2 into the right 1. And it looks like now we've got both of our solutions. Go ahead and put a couple more points there. And then we can connect those to form our line. So we've got, once again, two points where our two graphs intersect with one another, one of which was at the y-intercept for both graphs. So that would be 0, 9. The other was the vertex of the quadratic, actually, and the line cross one another, and that was at the point 2, 5. All right. Now, it's also possible to use your graphing calculator to solve these as well. So let's talk about how you can use your graphing calculator to find the point of intersection. In order to do that, we're going to graph both of our equations on number 3 at the same time. So we're going to go to y equals on your graphing calculator, and if there's still anything in there, like I still have an equation from the other day, we'll go ahead and clear that. Let's go ahead and type in our equation, so 2x squared plus x, so 2x squared plus x, and then our second equation is x minus 4. When we get ready to graph, let's go ahead and graph from the standard viewing window. So we'll hit zoom and then zoom 6 for zoom standard. And we should be able to see our quadratic right there and our linear equation right there. So without having to do any other work, we can already see what type of system this is. This is going to be a system where there is no solution for our system of equations. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at a different one. Let's go ahead and take a look at number 4 then. We'll go back into y equals. We'll type in x squared minus 6x plus 10 for our first equation. For our second equation, pretty simple, just the number 1. We'll go ahead and hit graph since we've already got it in the standard viewing window. And we should be able to see our quadratic first and our line second. So it looks as though this time we are going to have a solution. In fact, it looks like that's going to be just a single solution. Let's go ahead and calculate that. In order to do that, we're going to use the calc menu like we did in the previous section. And this time, we actually do want to choose option 5 for intersect. I remember we were being careful and not choosing that for the x-intercepts. But for intersect, we actually do want to find the point of intersection. So it's going to take you through a couple commands. The first command, it will ask you for first curve. What it means is that it wants you to make sure that your cursor is on either your quadratic or your linear equation. 
On this one, it's on the quadratic, and we'll go ahead and press enter. For second curve, you just need to make sure it's on the other one. So our quadratic was the first curve. It's now on the line, so that's our second curve. It's then going to ask you to guess. So once again, we're going to move our cursor using the left and right arrows to try to get it as close as possible to the point of intersection and press enter one last time. And it's going to tell us that our point of intersection is at 3 comma 1. Remember that any time you have um, that 2.999 and all those 9s after it, we're just rounding that up to a whole number. All right, one last system to look at. Let's go ahead and get that typed in for number 5. So we've got x squared plus 4x minus 1. And then for our second equation, we've got y is equal to 3x plus 1. Okay, so x squared plus 4x minus 1, and then 3x plus 1, and let's go ahead and hit graph. All right, so in this case, it actually does look like we're going to have two different solutions. We're going to have one down here and one further up here. So let's go ahead and hit second calc to get our um, menu to pop up, and then we'll choose intersect. Once again, we'll make sure it's on the first curve, so that's the quadratic. Second curve, it's now on the line. And for guess, let's go ahead and get this solution right here first, which is at the point 1, 4. Next, let's go ahead and do the exact same thing. So second calc, we'll choose option 5 for intersect once again. We're on our first curve. Let's just move it over a little bit so it looks like we're on our quadratic for the first curve, on our line for the second curve. And now for guess, we're going to move to the other place where they are intersecting one another, which is at the point negative 2, negative 5. So that would be your two solutions for number 5. So obviously, just like with systems of linear equations, you can solve systems of nonlinear equations where one is quadratic and the other is linear by graphing. There were two other methods that we had as well. So if you remember, we, still, we also had substitution as well as elimination as our methods to solve a system of linear equations. Turns out we can also use those for nonlinear equations as well. So let's take a look at those. For number six, I'll show you how to do that by using substitution. For number seven, I'll show you how to do that by elimination. Okay, so starting with number six, let's go ahead and solve by substitution. So we're looking for where we have a variable by itself, and it turns out we have y by itself in both equations. So really what we're gonna do is we're gonna take one of our equations, so for example, seven x plus one, and set that equal to our other equation, by substituting that in for y. In other words, we're going to have 7x plus 1 equal to x squared plus 3x minus 4. So to solve this, we now just have a single variable. We have x. We're looking for our solutions to a quadratic. In order to do that, we need to get at least one side to equal 0. So let's go ahead and subtract 7x and subtract 1 from both sides of our equation. And that way we can get our left side of our equation to be 0. So now we have that 0 is equal to x squared minus 4x minus 5. And now we just need to figure out how we plan to solve this equation. So well, let's decide what the best method would be. So let's start by trying to factor it. If we're going to factor this, we need numbers that multiply to be negative 5 that add to be negative 4. And it turns out we can actually find those numbers. So that would just be negative 5 and positive 1. Negative 5 multiplied by 1 is negative 5, and negative 5 plus 1 is negative 4. Once we've got those factors to get our solutions, we just need to set each of them equal to 0 and get that x is equal to 5 or that x is equal to negative 1. Now remember we're solving a system of equations, so our answers, just like when we were graphing, need to be written as points. And this is not the point 5 comma negative 1. So don't try to do that. Remember, these are x values. So actually, we're going to end up with two different points, one of which is going to have an x value of 5, the other of which is going to have an x value of negative 1. So to get the y value, we need to take our x values and plug them into one of our two equations. My recommendation would be to put them into this second equation where it's linear just because it's a little bit easier to simplify 
when we're solving that. So that would be 7 multiplied by 5 plus 1 for our first point, which is 35 plus 1, which is 36. So one of our solutions would be 5 comma 36. The other solution, we would use negative 1 for x, so 7 multiplied by negative 1 plus 1, and that's negative 7 plus 1, which is negative 6. So our second solution is going to be negative 1 comma negative 6. All right. As for the second equation, for number 7, we're going to solve these by elimination, which means we need to get a variable to go away. And oftentimes when you're solving a system of nonlinear equations, the variable that you want to get rid of is going to be y. Because there really is no way to get rid of x, especially because in the first equation, you'd have to not only get rid of x, but also x squared. So usually y is going to be the one that we will try to get rid of. In this case, we're not going to be able to add the equations right away because the y's are not going to cancel. It would be really nice for one y to be positive and the other y to be negative. And actually, we can make that work. Our second equation, if we make y negative, we also need to make negative 2 or 2x two negative. So our second equation now is going to be that negative y is equal to negative 2x. Now our first equation has not changed, so that's still y is equal to x squared plus 10x plus 7. And now to eliminate, we're just going to add those two equations together. So negative y plus y is 0. On the right side, we'll have x squared, and then negative 2 plus 10 is positive 8x plus 7. So once again, we need to solve that quadratic equation now that it's equal to 0. We need to figure out how to solve this. Again, we should probably start by trying to factor if possible. So numbers that multiply to be 7 and add to be 8. There's only one possible option, and it's a good thing that that works, which is x plus 7 and x plus 1. So then our two solutions, set each of those equal to 0 and solve, are going to be negative 7 and negative 1. Now once again, just like a number 6, we need to write both of those as points. So the first one is going to have an x value of negative 7. The second is going to have an x value of negative 1. And again, my recommendation to you when you're plugging those back into one of your two equations is to use the linear equation just because it's a little easier. So that would be 2 multiplied by negative 7 for our first point, which is going to be at negative 14. And then y is equal to 2 multiplied by negative 1 for our second point, so y is going to be negative 2. Alright, so that pretty much does it for systems of nonlinear equations. Also in this section, we're going to talk very quickly about quadratics um, and where they're useful with applications. So I've got a couple of application problems for us to look at. Um, and then we will be done with the notes. So number eight, the Impala, while it's also a car, is also the most powerful jumper in the antelope family. When an Impala jumps, its path through the air can be modeled by the equation y is equal to negative 0.0444x squared plus 1.333x, where x is the Impala's horizontal distance that's traveled and y is its corresponding height in feet. So we want to know how high can an Impala jump and how far can it jump. This is where the graphing calculator is going to be very useful. Let's go ahead and use our graphing calculator to graph this quadratic equation. So we're going to plug that in, negative 0.0444x to the power of 2 plus 1.333x, and then we should be good to go ahead and hit graph. Now what we're going to find by hitting graph is that we're not actually going to be able to see everything for our quadratic equation. In fact, it looks like we've only got part of the left side of it. We don't have the right side because that would be somewhere kind of way out in here. So what we're going to do is we're going to change our window just a little bit. And we need for it to go further to the right. So we're going to change our x maximum to be something bigger like 25. And then once we go ahead and hit graph, we'll see if we can see the whole thing now. So here comes our jump, and we're not quite there just yet. We still have a little bit more to go. This is kind of the trial and error part of graphing, guys, and this is something that I will not be able to help you with on the test for this unit. So it'll be up to you to really practice using your graphing calculator and changing your window to be able to see everything. 
Now, x as a maximum of 25 wasn't far enough. We need to go further. Let's maybe go out to 40 or 50. We'll do 40. So now we can see our graph. Here comes the impala. And now we can actually see most of it. I think the top of it's a little bit cut off, though. So let's go ahead and for our window, since we need it to be a little bit taller, let's change our y maximum to be something like 15. And that way we should be able to, once we hit graph, see everything on our graph. It's important when you're changing your window to not go back to the zoom menu, but to just hit graph. Zoom will kind of do its own thing. So make sure when you're changing window to just hit graph once you've changed anything. So now we need to answer two different questions. We need to know how high can it jump and how far can it jump. Let's answer the how high can it jump part. So we need to know what is this height right here. So that's going to be our maximum. So we're going to do second calc and choose maximum. Again, it's going to ask us for those different things. So left bound, and we'll move to the left. Right bound, and we'll move to the right. And then we'll guess and try to get it as close to the top as possible, which ends up being at 15.01 feet and at a height of 10.00951. So it looks like how high can it jump? That would be the Y value. Um, so that would be a about 10 feet. I'm just going to round that off um, since it's pretty close to 10. The next thing we know is want to know is how far can it jump. So we need to know where does it cross our x-axis over here on the right-hand side. So second calc, and this time we want to know if it crosses the axis, which would be a zero. So again, we're going to pick somewhere to the left of that zero, and it doesn't matter how far to the left, so you could actually leave it all the way back here if you wanted to. For right bound, we just need to move it somewhere to the right of where that zero is. And then we'll go ahead and make our guess, which looks like about right here. And that's going to tell us that at 30.03 feet, so I'll go ahead and round to the nearest hundredth here, um, but it looks like about 30.03 feet is how far it can jump. Pretty far, pretty high too. All right. Last, let's take a look at one last example of kind of where this would, would work. Um, so we were looking at the path of a basketball being shot. It can be modeled with that equation where x is your horizontal distance in feet and y is corresponding height in feet. So if there was no hoop, how far would the ball travel? Let's go ahead and figure that out. So let's go ahead and go back to y equals. We'll clear out our equation from the previous example. And let's go ahead and type in our new equation. So negative 0 0.07 in parentheses x minus 10.76, close our parentheses squared, plus 14.8. And let's go ahead and hit graph and just see if that would work for us. Here comes our basketball. And hey, we got kind of lucky. We were actually able to see um, kind of how far that would be. So we want to know how far would it go if it did not hit the hoop. So if there's no hoop over here that we're shooting at, obviously the shooter we're imagining is on our y-axis, shooting our basketball. We want to know where would it land over here. Once again, that's a zero, so second calc, option two. For left bound, again, somewhere to the left of that zero. So somewhere in here. Right bound, we have to move a little bit further to get somewhere to the right of that zero and press enter, and then we'll guess where that is. About right there is about as close as we can get. So that's going to be at 25.3 feet. All right, for part B, assuming that the hoop is regulation height and size, so you've got a 10 foot tall hoop and an 18 inch rim size, how far away should the hoop be placed so that the ball goes through the hoop? Well, let's do this. So if we know the height of the hoop is 10 feet, let's just go ahead and graph y equals 10. And that'll let us see. Um, kind of where our graphs are going to cross one another. So it looks like this point right here is where the ball would be making contact if the hoop was 10 feet tall. So we really want to know what is that point of intersection between those two. So let's go ahead and use graphing calculator to find that. Second calc. We're going to choose option number five for intersect. First curve, sure, on our quadratic. Second curve on our linear equation. And we'll see where those two intersect. So it looks like that's going to be at 19.04 feet. 
Now, the other thing we need to think about, though, is this 18-inch rim size. So if we're thinking about kind of what that would look like, you know, we've got our ball, we've got our hoop, it's going, we want it to go through right here. So actually, that's where we want the rim to be, and the basket a little bit to the right of that. So we actually need to kind of add in some of the rim distance. And with rim distance of 18 inches, if we want it to go right through the middle, we would need it to be going through it at about 9 inches which for feet, nine inches is the same as 0 0.75 feet. So we need to take our hoop, which originally was gonna be at 19 feet, and add the extra 0 0.75 feet to it so that we make sure it goes through the hoop and doesn't just hit the backboard itself. So it looks like we need to place our hoop at about 19.79 feet in order for the ball to go through the hoop. All right, guys, that is it for this section of the notes. In fact, that is it for this unit. Until next time, have a great rest of your day.